Welcome to the first chapter. Burn Crosses, Tales from the South Side, final chapter. And then there'll be an epilogue too, so there'll be two more videos. This shit, uh, is gonna be pretty much, uh, 1989. 88 89. She's saying. Thirty fucking years ago. Bombs away, bitch. Johnny, Johnny Ray. Matthew. Yo. do this. I'm going to take you fucking on the final journey. 1989. So, uh, sit back, relax. I got my friends, uh, Kerm, Do Kerm Dog and, uh, Million Dollar Murph. So let's get it.
when Jorge finally came through with Ron, he soon left for Seattle. I told Jorge not to hold me accountable for Ron and any blame for any of his fuck-ups. In the time Ron was gone, I made a, a routine trip back to Iowa and sold a quick 10 pounds to the country boys and stayed at Frankie's apartment while in Des Moines. I kept my visibility at a low and Frankie took all the extra took the extra two pounds with cash on top. So no front. I was gone a total of three days. Everything was set up with the country boys to do another deal. So as soon as I could go back, I emphasized the urgency with Jorge to get more, uh, get another run ready by Christmas. <sighs> run had yet to arrive back in Tucson from Seattle, but had sent some money to Jorge Western Union to take the pressure off. Sorry, I just have to be able to read this. Was Alicia stopped by. And this was a girl that Ron had brought by the house. And it was obviously she wanted to get with me. So I was able to uh, take care of her needs. This was one hour before my plane took off back to Iowa with 19 pounds. She was pretty cute. Was kind of small. But I wanted to see her again. With the 20 pounds in my suitcase, with 20 pounds in my suitcase, she says, she, excuse me, my handwriting is bad. With my suitcase in hand, she took me to the airport. I should be back in a week, I told her. When I hit Des Moines, the country boys were nowhere to be found. With 20 pounds to move, it was back to the drawing board. I had to branch back out. Selling a pound here and there, trying to land a big fish again. Everything in Iowa City had been blown over by now, but Murph and the boys would only take a couple pounds off of my hands. One week after being back in town, I was involved in a near-fatal traffic accident. Coming home from the bar with Frankie and a friend, Matt McLean, we decided to gravel travel back to Frankie's apartment down Hartford around the back side of uh, Pioneer Park. 
See, Frankie drove this piece of shit Granada in the winter so he could park his badass Camaro in, in the garage. He brought the car for a hundred dollars, and but it ran, uh, but it ran. Other than that, it looked like shit. Coming around a hard right curve at about sixty miles an hour, an hour a herd of, a herd of deer crossed the path. Frankie swerved only to fly off the road and into a tree no longer than six inches in diameter. Fucking tree stopped us dead in our tracks. As we hit the tray, as we hit the tree, Frankie's hard Italian head collided with mine, just about knocking me unconscious. After putting my, his heart, my hand against my head, I realized I was bleeding pretty bad. Matt wasn't so lucky. He was passed out cold in the back seat. So we thought, we're less than a mile from the apartment, and Frankie ran back in the cold and got his Camaro. We loaded Matt, Matt up in the car and we went straight to the to the hospital. Next thing I remember, Frankie was pulling up to the emergency room and Matt was being brought in on a stretcher. Able to walk, I went in and sought treatment for my wounds. By the time I left the hospital, I now had two black eyes along with my eye glued shut and with stitches, stitched shut. It was now one week before Christmas and I had 15 pounds still in my hand. And everybody knows in the business, the big buyers by law around Christmas time, nobody wants to have jail at Christmas. So nobody wants to do any business. With Matt, he wasn't just knocked out. He had a blood clot in his head that caused an aneurysm, which almost killed him. Dude had to get a life flight at Iowa City and endured a painful recovery process. Without a buyer, I'd have decided to hustle what I could, Western Union to Jorge, as many as the, as the money came in, I sent it. This became a long and drawn out process and took me well into January before I flew back to Tucson. Frankie was between jobs, but kept his money tied up in the weed and had enough money to live off as it was. That night, I was to fly out. Frankie and I spent the afternoon at strip joints. He had never flown anywhere before. So, the more we drank, the more I was able to talk him into coming to Tucson with me. I always took the red eye back to Tucson, which has a one stop in Las Vegas. It's a two hour layover. Frankie and I got shit faced drunk on the plane that it was pretty rowdy. Most of the passengers were going to Vegas. In all my stopovers in Vegas, I had let to, yet to venture down to the strip. Although I had been to Las Vegas. Even though I had $40 in my pocket, we decided to catch a cab to the strip. There we were, lighting a joint up in the cab as we proceeded down the off ramp to the strip. Frankie wasn't much of a gambler at the time, but most of us hit small jackpots. But both of us hit small jackpots. Mine was for 60 bucks and Frankie popped one for $200. We decided to call the airlines and pick a hotel room and check out Vegas the next day. Being midweek and all rooms in Vegas were going for like 20 bucks a night. Since our plane did not leave Vegas until midnight, we put in for we paid for two nights. Even though we weren't high rollers, just walking down Las Vegas Boulevard makes you feel like one. We must have walked 10 miles between casinos that night. After a dining vet dash at a 495 prime rib at the dunes at 4 a.m., we headed back to the Imperial Palace where our room was. We woke up around noon. Frankie and I would walk to 7-Eleven to buy some rolling papers so we could roll a couple joints and hit the motherfucking town on foot. Our goal was to make it downtown to the old strip. We cut across the desert and golf course 
and made it as far as Vegas World. As we walked back to the motel, hotel, the blister on my heel was killing me. This would be not my last case of what would be known as Vegas Foot. As I stopped outside our hotel, I took my shoe off. Frankie was laughing his ass off at my expense. And a, a woman passersby got a laugh at my plight as well. Both of us were pretty worn out. So we, we called, calmed down, called down and got a wake-up call for 10 p.m. Back on the plane and back to Tucson. Frankie stayed for three or four days, but had to return due to his girlfriend, Barb, bitching at him. Sorry, Barb. Love you. He never told her he was going to Tucson with me. And she was pissed off he didn't call when he was in Tucson two days later. I had always wanted to show my friends how nice Arizona winters were. With Frankie coming down, it made it complete. He'd be back. That was for sure. It, I only ended up being two days behind Frankie. This time, Jorge sent me with nine pounds again, and I rebuilt my organization. It was Frankie on top with Mike Bell and Murph as second options. Sean Moley was always turning a couple pounds here and there. Basically, I sold it to anyone else down the line that I'd known since high school that had cash in hand. My minimum was a quarter pound, and people knew that. Joel Baker started getting in on the action, being my per uh, number one being my personal driver. Actually, it was called Deals on Wheels. If I had a deal to make, I'd throw Joel some cash. For the ride, most of the time, I just paid him in weed. Over the next two months, I stayed with the same core of people. Watched my money a little closer and kept looking for one cash buyer. Every time I went to Iowa, I'd have dinner at King Caesars and we'd have the best meal in town. By now, Joey never worked there. He'd left <coughs> over Freddie's big mouth. See, before Judy married Tina, she got pregnant. There was a rumor that she, the kid belonged to somebody else. And uh, let's just say uh, they weren't friends for a while. For a couple years after that. That night in question, but as it is, money changed everything. That night in question, back in July of, of 1988, Joey was out there with me doing coke. <clears throat> he had a fight with Tina <coughs> while I had dinner. And she left the last thing she said that she's going to go out and get fucked. I have to be <coughs> the other guy's friend as well. Um, I guess who showed up that night at his house? She did. Pretty much convenient. Still weird to tur turn up pregnant uh, a month later. If you knew Freddie, you would know the dude never shuts up. I guess Dewey got tired of hearing about how much of a slut the woman was. She tried to fuck me, too. She was about... She was about to marry... So Joey took a job up at Swift driving a forklift. Swift, the nastiest smelling place in all of Des Moines to work out. A fucking packing plant. For all I know, Joey no longer was dealing coke anymore, and he wasn't. He pretty much dropped out of my mix altogether. Odd how people enter your life at one time or another. It really is. Take the night. Of a drunken bitch got bad with, with Joel and I. If it weren't for Johnny Black, I would have gotten rolled for all the cash I had in my pocket. 3000 k the cash or some, you know, $3,000 some out of cash that night. I had my leather jacket. Rolling from the bar that night, was, I was with some junky fuck named Shane Pratt that we all knew from high school. I was trying to score some coke, and I was on a roll. He had just... And had, 
and had just sold 15 pounds and collected all the cash in a week's time. I left all the money for Jorge at Frankie's apartment but had my $3,000 profit with me. Making a mistake of flashing my wad of cash around, Shane had plans for me as I sat in his car and he went into a house to score some blow. It's outside of Jeff Bowman's house. Over, uh, anyway, bam, bam, bam. I look up and there's Johnny Black tapping on the car window. What the fuck you doing with him, Johnny said. I guess he's trying to score some blow, I responded. Dude, come into my house. He said he had some guy in his car with at least $2,000 cash on him. He asked... He said I was from Arizona, let's roll him. And then Johnny asked, and he said my name, Ray Lakers, Ray Lagos, RL. No, he said Lakers. I told him to step the fuck back and sit his ass down. That's why I'm out here, to save your ass. Hey, John, I forgot about that 250 you still owe me. Thanks, man. It had been over a year. Since I talked to Johnny Black, as bad of a reputation he had as being a thief and a coke addict, dude saved my ass that night. He's a fucking all-time badass. I proceeded into the house with John, looked at Shane and said, Don't ever think I don't have people looking out for me. I always make myself out like I was connected because of the amount of times I made it through airports, my reputation was becoming legendary. Must have blown 250 that night smoking cocaine, trying to impress, uh, impress a bunch of junkie fucks that never been outside of Des Moines their whole lives. What a fucking waste. We had to get back to Frankie's place and get some sleep. It was Friday and my goal was to return on Sunday. I got a call around 3 p.m. It was from Denise Mitchum. I met her out of the Hard Times East one night with Joe Baker. We one night. The last time I was in town. Denise and I or uh, Denise didn't I didn't with Denise I didn't have to worry about her knowing what I did her older brother Danny used to buy dime bags off Frankie and I back in junior high school I impressed her Denise was just the type of girl I used to keep myself straight for a while the first night we were together she called me up at Frankie's after meeting at the bar that night Let's just say I was drunk off my ass by the time she showed up. Literally, I wasn't worth the fuck. Didn't get it up for shit. You know what? The next day, when I called her, she answered. She accepted my offer of a second chance. Women usually don't take kindly to a limp dick. Most men are too embarrassed when it happens. For me, a lot of times... If it's, I feel comfortable around the woman, sometimes it can be in the way they walk, they talk, and the way they look. She has reddish brown hair at 18. Short hair, 5'2", my 6'3". She wasn't overweight, wait, but she, at the, she had, Denise, you had a big booty then, and, but, you man, you are so beautiful today. Uh, that's that's all. That's all another conversation. When I ran into you all those years later, Ooh. it didn't bother me though. I was happy to spend time with her instead of doing dope with my buddies. Let's just say I sealed the deal the second night and the third night. 
when did you get in town, Denise asked. My brother David, he said he saw you at the bar last night. I hesitated answering, so I asked, why don't you pick me up at 7 o'clock? I'll explain. I got to get back to sleep. It might have been 8 o'clock. It might be 8 o'clock, okay? She said, coming off a binge, free basing is no picnic. I had a fucking headache, and so we went out for steak. Spent most of the time telling her that I kept a low profile until my business was nearly done. I gotta play it safe. Sorry, I don't call you from Arizona, but I think about you. Every night I sleep alone, but when I'm in Des Moines, I'm sleeping with you, I told her. Joel started calling her my princess because the way I lavish money and weed to Denise. But if anything, she was my she was my queen because I was the king. Joel, there ain't one decent woman that wants to be with a drug smuggler except a call girl, I told him. I gotta take what I can get in the real world. The next four weeks, I made, made three trips, all successful, all profitable. <clears throat> Fuck, I was ready to buy a car and take the show back on the road. The one thing that changed was my route to Des Moines. I've gotten, I'd gotten paranoid around using the Des Moines airport, so I began flying into Omaha. From Omaha, I would take a cab to the Greyhound and would proceed to Des Moines from there. When the business was done, I would then spend my time with Denise. No more coke business. Late that afternoon, before I was to leave town, I believe it was February or so that that year of uh, 1989, I ran into Joey Gacko at the 7-Eleven with Joel. Joel was pumping gas in the car, and I looked back to, sh to see Joey getting gas too. He had been out of the loop since his feud with Freddie and the boys at King Sooth and the boys at King Sooth. Now married to Tina, they were expecting a baby any day. Joey, what's been happening? I said to him as I went into the store. Tina's due any day. I'm working out at Swift. Good luck with the baby, I told it, Joey. I gotta run. My plane leaves at 9 o'clock. Later, man. Hey, hook me up with the bag. Joey said, get a hold of Joel later tonight. He'll hook you up. At the time, <clears throat> buyers consisted of Frankie Scalise, two to three pounds at a time, Murph and Iowa City, five to ten pounds, Bob, Bobby Bobcat James, two pounds, along with five or six others. I still sold quarter pounds and ounces too. I fronted Joel quarter pounds so he could so I would send anyone looking for a bag to him. As long as the weed was good and the price was right, selling to 10 to 15 pounds in a week time was no problem. It was getting to be routine. Joel dropped me off at Frankie's around 6 p.m. so I could gather my stuff. I had to get to the airport. <clears throat> I had Denise get, give me a lift to the airport. She wanted to go inside to the gate, but I insisted on being dropped off at the curb. Since Joel still owed me for a quarter pound, I decided to give him a call when I was still in town and give instruction on the, the money when he got it together, as far as like Senate Western Union. The following conversation ensued. Get this, Joel began to tell me. I just got back from selling Joey an ounce. He says for you to call him before you leave town. He's got a big buyer. Supposed to be able to buy it all. I got Joey's number and gave him a call. So. More tales from the south side. When I went to the airport to fly back to Arizona that night. Uh, America Air Airlines was a popular airline for people going to Arizona or Las Vegas. But when I got there. There was Joe Vavone, his crew, Lance Greco, his, Brian from Des Moines who lived in Phoenix, 
and Vinny Tia. They were all there seeing Brian off at the airport. Joey answered on the first ring. Joey, long time, I said, making light of the fact that I had just seen him three hours before. Joel said, you got a big fish, I told him. <clears throat> Joey then cried to me, man, more than that, I need to make some money. With the baby on the way and Tina out of work, driving a forklift ain't, just ain't paying the bills. How well do you know the guy, I asked. He's a friend of my brother, and he works at Swift with me. I should be back in a week. I'll call you from over at Frankie's. It was only a couple of blocks or so. Frankie's apartment was only a couple of blocks from Joey, so I'll give you a call when I get back, I said. He's ready now. Try and turn around and come right back. If you can, Joey responded with a sense of urgency. I'll call you. I got to get on the plane, man. Later, I told him. Later, said Joey. When I got back, I gave Jorge the good word about my next buyer. Jorge was quick to get my next run ready set up. It just so happened his friend Ricardo from Obregon, Sonora had just showed up with 13 pounds and I left as soon as it was in my hands. Only in Tucson long enough to buy a 73 Camaro that needed an engine. It was back on the plane to Omaha. When I made my connection in Las Vegas, it wasn't uncommon for me to run into someone from Iowa on the flight. It just so happened Bobby Bobcat James and his girlfriend Desi Keeper were on the flight. He was not looking forward to go back to Iowa. One of his guys... A low-level coke dealer who had more traffic in his house than McDonald's got busted, Doc. I had made plenty of trips over to Doc's to score some coke and knew it was a matter of time before he'd get popped, so it didn't surprise me. On the plane, as the plane took off, I switched seats, seats with some dude whose seat was across the aisle from Bobcat. Pounding beers until we landed in Omaha, I made arrangements to call Bob the following day so he could sell a pound. The quality was high and I decided to sell the bulk to Joey's buyer. So one to Frankie and split the rest up into quarter pounds. Joey arrived immediately after his shift at 3 o'clock that afternoon from, ship, from Swift. Grabbing a sample to take to the buyer, he was back at 4 o'clock with cash for 10 pounds. I can't tell you how bad I need to make some money, Joey tells me. This guy said he's ready once a week. If you can do it, he's for real. I responded, as long as his money's real, that's all that matters to me. By Friday, I had the quarter pound left to sell. And I'd been getting on Joel to get a buyer so he could make some money off of the top. He'd been in and out of, of touch with people he was trying to get reconnected with over the last three or four years after high school. Joel wanted a bigger slice of the pie after seeing how successful Frankie and I were. The inside joke among us was graduating from the RL School of Finances. If you could make $100 cash for 10 minutes of work, you graduated. So... If I wanted $450 for half a pound, and you could clear $100 of the top selling it for $550, Joel. One buyer, one deal, $100. Easy money. Fuck this shit. I was going for $100, $1,200 a pound cash. So it was easy to undercut any dealers, current suppliers. Never be greedy, I told Joel. My world is yours. Welcome to it. Joel called up the Franklin Brothers, a couple of... Bag dealers he'd known from high school out in Norwalk. <clears throat> Hadn't seen them in two years, but called them up on a whim and cut a deal for a half pound. When he graduated that night, it was no more deals on wheels and, and no hustling and hustling bags. Straight up money off the top for you now on. The remaining quarter pound 
I sold to the guy that we all knew from high school, Tom Brody. I sold him an ounce or two here and there. By getting... He was thinking he'd graduated for clearing $100 by getting over on the guy who had, he had brought Brody over to buy it. Problem was, he didn't know who his buyer was a friend of a friend was. Happy to pay $400 a quarter pound. The friend of a friend was a narc. Brody didn't know any better, and the problem would not surface for another month, and got the and Greed got the best of him. So since the business was taken care of, I spent the next two days with Denise. My plan was to return in a week, and I got back. Jorge had 26 pounds waiting for me. Able to move out of my brother's in February, I had my own place for the first time in my life. Life. Following my role of never overloading my suitcase, I left six pounds behind for the next run. Middle of May 1999, all the pieces were in place. Joey was good for 10 pounds. Frankie two for three. Murph was down for five. Sell the remaining more. That, that was my routine. At the end of that, this deal, I made enough to buy a 1980 full-size Chevy Blazer. That was going to be my source of transportation. So there it is. There it is. In my epilogue, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a, a few more tales of the South Side about what happened uh, in 1989 uh, after I met Paula. Um... Denise, I'm sorry I never fucking called you back uh, when I came back to Iowa a couple times that summer. Uh, I actually fucking faked my own death to fucking uh, try and fucking get Brody to shut up about the shit, which was the dumbest thing I could fucking ever do. So, uh, I got some bad fucking juju over that shit, so. Nothing but love. I'm gonna fucking do another bong hit. Uh, I'm fucking happy I fucking got this completed. You know, there's a lot of things, you know, that that I want to do in life, that I think about, and, you know, I just, it never materializes, you know, like doing this book, you know, it's like people, but you should write a book, you should do it, you should write a book, man, you got awesome stories, fuck, man, I should be fucking dead, man, it's what the fucking truth of the matter is, I should have never fucking, I should have never fucking lived through fucking a lot of shit. So be ready for my epilogue. I'm going to have that, that done later. It's going to be pretty deep too. So uh, peace. RL Cartel forever. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Joel and Frankie. And being my best friends. And uh, I'm sorry, Todd. That fucking, I got the fuck on my mind, fucking got so fucking twisted. Well, I'll, I'll talk about more of that epilogue. Peace.